It is the coerced suicide trial out of Tennessee. The defendant, Hayden Berkebile, is accused of encouraging 19-year-old Grace Sparks to kill herself for his viewing pleasure. The prosecution claims that Berkebile played suicide games with Sparks and it ended in tragedy. The defense claims the victim had been suicidal for years. The pair had a relationship since Sparks was 13 years old and often communicated using messaging apps. And those messages are key to this fascinating case. Attorneys say this criminal case against Berkevile is the first of its kind for the state of Tennessee. Court TV legal correspondent Joy Lim Nacron has a look at Tennessee versus Hayden Berkevile. A disturbing relationship ending in death. But did the actions amount to a crime? Prosecutors claim 29-year-old Hayden Jennings Berkebile drove 19-year-old Grace Ann Sparks to take her own life. We're going to ask that you find the defendant guilty of criminally negligent homicide uh, for his criminally negligent conduct uh, that resulted in Grace Ann Sparks' death and also for filing a false report. The pair engaged in an intense, long-distance relationship, largely online. Their documented Facebook messages paint a troubling picture of their interactions, including suicide games, during which Sparks ultimately died. You're gonna see that the practice of engaging in these suicide games was something uh, that took place during the course of this very short relationship, uh, intense relationship from July to September 2019 and what effect that had on the defendant when the victim used a gun uh, to play suicide edge games for his sexual gratification. Prosecutors say Berkebile coerced and controlled Sparks, driving her to perform demeaning and dangerous acts, including loading a bullet into a revolver to play Russian roulette and firing the bullet which ultimately killed her. We submit to you that the proof will show that Miss Sparks was looking for love. And the defendant in this case was looking to destruct a life and to watch a life be taken in front of him. The state has 1,300 messages, which they say prove their case, including these troubling texts from Berkebile stating, I'll piss on you, slut. Tell your brain to expletive and listen to what I tell it instead of making expletive up. Lucifer's got you. I want to kill you. I want to kill you on August 30th. Victim responds, why? Defendant, I don't know, I'm so gird. Victim says, please try to put into words. I want to understand. Defendant says, I don't have words. Defendant says, I just need. Victim says, what are you doing at the moment? Defendant says, in the bathroom masturbating. The defense claims this disturbing language was part of a role play between two damaged people playing pretend. The vacation type role play, not because he just wanted to. Proof is going to show she wanted as well. Proof is going to show that they had, perhaps foolishly, engaged in this lifestyle because they thought it would mitigate their feelings from what happened. They thought it would provide a release. They had tried therapy and it didn't work. They thought it was going to work. The defense says the victim survived most of the games by design. You're going to see time and time again they engage in suicide role play. She doesn't die. And they claim her own depression led her to take it too far. See the proof shows that she damaged people. Doing damaged people too. Messing up. Going about things the wrong way. But ultimately, good intentions. It is a um, strange case with um, a, a lot of strange facts that the jury in Tennessee uh, was exposed to. Marie Pereira is with us this morning. Um, but first, let's get to it with the opening statement. She's going to chime in with us as we watch this together. We're going to begin with the state of Tennessee. The assistant D district attorney is Hector Sanchez, and he outlines the state's case against Hayden Berkebile for the jury. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Grace Ann Sparks on September 29, 2019. Uh, she was 19 years old. Um, she had dreams to be a veterinarian. What you're going to learn about this case, ladies and gentlemen, is that this case revolves around the defendant and his deliberate, persistent uh, plan to coerce and control the victim, Grace Ann Sparks. We anticipate the proof will show, ladies and gentlemen, that 
This uh, deliberate attempt and persistent attempt to coerce and control the victim is documented in a voluminous amount of messages uh, that you are going to have to traverse through roughly 1,300 pages, ladies and gentlemen, such as, tie me up and just feed me stupid. No, I'm going to turn you over and take you from behind and throw the mirror. And make you put a gun in your mouth. You can see further proof about the defendant's control over this victim uh, throughout the span of roughly two and a half months. Tell your brain to shut the f up and listen to what it, I tell it instead of making it up. I told you to for me. Part of me also wants to kill you over this so I can't get in trouble. You want me to make you actually do it. I'll piss on you, slut. On September 29th, you're going to hear from Officer Chris Medina. Uh, he is with the Knoxville Police Department. He is one of the first responding officers, him and Officer Soldner. Uh, they responded to 603 Waybridge, that's here in Knox County. Uh, you'll see a map of exactly where that is. That's in West Knox County. That's the region that Officer Medina was charged with patrolling in that day. Uh, based on the 911 call from Hayden Berkabow, they do go to apartment 101. And what they encounter there is the victim's father, uh, who was uh, listening to listening to audio at the time and did hear a noise, but uh, did not think anything of it. Uh, proof would be the victim was in a closed door and the gun was in her mouth. Uh, they do make contact with Stephen Sparks, the victim's father, who was at her apartment. Uh, they say they're responding to a suicide. Uh, he is baffled by that, but leads him to a room. And ultimately they find uh, Gray Sparks uh, sitting Indian style, collapsed into her laps. Uh, with a 357 magnum between her legs and a cell phone uh, pointing at So generally, ladies and gentlemen, where this is, again, this is in West Knox County. Uh, this is Gleason. Uh, this is Kingston Pike. It's between Bearden High School and West Town Wall. This would be the relative apartment here. This is apartment, or 603, that houses apartment 101. Uh, you're going to hear about how the officers went to that apartment, arriving at the address, walking through the hallway, ultimately making it to apartment 101. And went inside the apartment. Uh, Officer Medina uh, traverses through the living room after making contact with the father, ultimately ends up in the bedroom uh, where they find Ms. Sparks. Uh, the proof will be that this was not the state she was in uh, when they first uh, made entry into the bedroom. This is the state that the medical personnel put her in to try to assess any signs of life. Further proof will be that a Magnum 357 specifically revolver was recovered in her lap, uh, and then that 357 was 138 special bullets. You're going to likewise hear from Investigator Chaz Terry. Uh, he is with the Knoxville Police Department Major Crimes Division. He's the lead investigator on this case. Uh, he's going to talk to you about this case and how originally it came out as a suicide and how it very quickly materialized into something else. He's going to tell you about those circumstances that led him to investigate further and to look deeper into this. Part of that is the defendant's 911 call. Uh, so he's armed with knowledge of who the last person she was on the phone with was. Uh, he knows that there was a phone pointed at the victim. And based on that information, uh, he ultimately recovers the Facebook messenger data uh, and conversations with the victim, Grace and Sparks, uh, and he's able to corroborate that uh, the victim and the defendant uh, had conversations leading to her death. You're further gonna hear a portion of the defendant's statement that he offered officers when he was arrested in Bloomington, Indiana. Now the proof will be that the forensic investigation of the messages is what kind of the driving factor in this case. Uh, not, not only the 911 call, but what was the context, what was the content of these conversations? Uh, why did Grace Ann Sparks uh, take her life in September 29, 2019? All right, at the beginning of the opening statement, we'll watch it all uh, this morning here. We're going to hear from both sides. Let's bring in Marie Pereira, though. She is a former prosecutor and now a criminal defense attorney. And Marie, this is such a bizarre case with the facts that these two were clearly engaged in a strange relationship, mile, hundreds of miles away, thousands of miles away. One, she was in Tennessee, he was up in Indiana. At first blush, when you hear the facts of this case, what are your thoughts in terms of holding this individual, Mr. Berkebile, criminally responsible for her death? 
First off, I commend the police for investigating and bringing him to justice. And I think in this age of digital awareness, this case really sends a clear message to cyber bullies, abusers, that words matter. It's really about accountability and deterrence at this point. What about the argument, hey, it takes two to tango and these two were going back and forth for years? It doesn't matter if they were going back and forth for years. I think it makes it even worse that he was well aware that she had suicidal ideations, that she had a history of depression, and he was contacting her from the age of 13. She was 13 and he was 21 when they started their cyber romance, so to speak. So he was, even at that time, a pedophile, an abuser, a sexual abuser, and it doesn't matter if he was doing it from a distance. In this age, I think accountability, especially with social media and that type of contact is dangerous and people need to be held accountable and that's what the police are doing. And I, I think it's completely appropriate in this modern age that they should be prosecuting cyber abusers as well. Yeah, it's fascinating. They, they find a young woman with a, a, a gun in her hand, basically, in her, in her lap, dead. Um, it is clearly a suicide, and the fact that they took that step of not just saying, oh, suicide, let's move on to our next call, um, it's, uh, this is where we got now. Now it is a criminal trial because they did take that time, like you pointed out, to investigate and figure out why and what happened. Uh, and that's what led them to Indiana and the defendant. Coming up, the prosecution claims the victim was looking for love, but the defendant was looking to watch someone die. More from the state's opening statement. That's next. Dot com today. Back this morning, we are airing the disturbing case out of Tennessee. It is Tennessee versus Hayden Berkebile. The defendant faced a jury for criminal charges of neglect and filing a, a false police report for the death of 19-year-old Grace Sparks. The two had an unusual relationship, to put it mildly, which included suicide role-playing. The jury had to decide if her death and the defendant's actions amounted to a crime. Let's pick it up with the opening statements right where we left off with the assistant district attorney Hector Sanchez addressing the jury. And the proof will be that they are filled with coercion and control. Do you want to die now? How do you want to die? Truthfully, I'm sitting in the bathroom into this conversation. I have one requirement. I get to watch. I make the rules. Further proof we submit to you uh, hinges on control and coercion. I set the expectations. It has always been that I get to watch. Because if you want to make the dream come true, that's like half of the dream. And ladies and gentlemen, the proof will be again that these conversations lasted for roughly two and a half months. There were some conversations beforehand, the break in the relationship, but from July until September 29th, uh, that's when these conversations uh, got heavy. I want to kill you on August 30th. Victim responds, why? Defendant, I don't know, I'm so gird. Victim says, please try to put into words, I want to understand. Defendant says, I don't have words. Defendant says, I just need. Victim says, what are you doing at the moment? Defendant says, in the bathroom masturbating. Again, on the 30th of August, coercion and control. Victim says, how would you like me to die? Defendant says, gun. Victim asks, which one? Defendant states, revolver. Same day, August 30th. Victim says, what if I could choke myself to death? Victim offers, watch me turn the pretty colors. Defendant says, gun. Victim says, I know a way to hang myself. Defendant says, gun, period, naked, period, with a plug-in. Coercion and control is what you're gonna find uh, in these roughly 1,300 pages of messages between Grace Ann Sparks and Hayden Jennings Berkeley. 
Brace in, Sparks. I'll end for you, blowing my head off, but no video chat with this. I lose my nerve with you watching. Defendant says, then never mind. Again, we submit to control, coercion. Victim, you don't want me to die? Victim, what if I got something to light myself on fire with? Defendant, only if I can watch. Coercion and control. Victim says, I mean, I can go get some gasoline. Defendant says, only, period, if, period, I, period, can, period, watch, period. August 30th, victim says, or you can go find a pole, or I can go find a pole in the interstate. Defendant's response, gun, period, watching, period, or period, no, period, death, period. Victim, yes, daddy. Further conversations of coercion and control on August 30th, 2019, defendant states, you follow orders so well. Defendant sends a heart. Victim responds, I didn't kill myself, so I suck at following orders. Defendant says, I told you to stop before you did. Defendant says, so you are great at following orders. We submit to you further proof of coercion and control. Defendant states, gun or hanging, I'll let you choose. Victim says, gun. Defendant says, okay, same thing as yesterday, naked, revolver. Victim says, yeah, give me a minute and we'll get set up for you. Defendant says, this time, question mark. Defendant says, call me when you are set up. Now, ladies and gentlemen, beyond these messages of coercion and control, uh, there's a different uh, kind of meaning to these messages that you're gonna see. And we submit to you that you're gonna see what Grace Ann Sparks was looking for uh, and compare that to what Hayden Jennings Berkabau uh, was looking for. Uh, we submit to you that the proof will show that Ms. Sparks was looking for love. And the defendant in this case was looking to destruct a life and to watch a life be taken in front of him. Corroboration of that, we anticipate the proof will show. The victim, I love you, I'm sorry you're irritated. You're my favorite. You're my good man, my best friend. You make me happy. The only one who can talk me out of the bad moods of my depression and out of bed. You calm my anxiety and help me think rationally. I can't live my life without it. Best dog parent I know, best protector, and you're pretty good in bed. That's 30 days before the victim's death. Further, 30 days before the victim's death, the victim says, want some space, question mark? The defendant says, I want to kill you. Proof's gonna be that Ms. Spark responds with, please try to put in the words, I wanna understand. Pretty please. Again, 30 days before her death. Defense response to that, I don't have words. I just need. Victor responds, okay. Why don't you kill me because we'll release sexual stress, we'll help resolve frustration by taking the aggression out on me, we'll make you feel better, Defense response, yes. Victim, will you like seeing me die? Defense, yes. Victim, what if I could choke myself to death? Defendant, young. Yeah. You're gonna have these messages, ladies and gentlemen. You're gonna have a chance again to go through each and every one of them. You're gonna see the tone of these conversations and we submit to you the proof will show that the victim was looking for a relationship, was looking for someone to love, and the defendant was looking for something else. The victim says, 30 days before death, you don't want me to die? The defendant responds, not if I can't watch. Only if I can watch. The defendant responds, gun watching or no death? Yes, daddy. And ladies and gentlemen, you're going to see that the practice of engaging in these suicide games was something uh, that took place during the course of this very short uh, relationship, uh, intense relationship from July to September 2019, and what effect that had on the defendant when the victim used a gun 
uh, to play suicide edge games for his sexual gratification. 24 days before the victim's death. September 5th, 2019, the victim says, I'm not horny. I don't feel any drive. The defendant's response, small plug, vibrator, and choke yourself, worthless whore. Defendant states, did I give you an option? Are you going to follow orders like a good bitch? Victim states, yes, sir. Defendant says, good girl. 24 days before the victim's death, defendant says, do you want to die? Defendant says, answer the question. Victim says, no, I don't want to die. Please use me later to feel better. It will make me feel good to be useful. Defendant's response to that, suicide play, question mark. I really want the behind you now as you blow your head off. Still ahead, the prosecution tells the jury about the moment the defendant was arrested and the unsettling details investigators uncovered about Hayden Perkabile's relationship with the victim. And a cake. TV this morning we're watching opening statements in the coerced suicide trial out of Tennessee. The state is laying out its case against 29-year-old Hayden Berkabile. He's accused of encouraging 19-year-old Grace Sparks to kill herself. This is the first case of its kind in the state of Tennessee with prosecutors charging a man with criminal negligent homicide when he was hundreds of miles away from the victim who shot herself. Let's get back into the court for the final moments of the state's opening statement. And you're going to see that the victim at some points tries to deflect uh, from this type of behavior uh, by talking and asking about what the defendant's wife is into, what helps his wife relax. Coercion and control. The victim says, I'll take a picture for you later. No, no picture. Defense says. Again, nine days before the victim's death. So what does Jess do for self-care relaxing? Which would be that Jess is the defendant's wife uh, who resides in Bloomington, Indiana. I'm so aggro. Okay, get some space, I'm sorry. Five days before the victim's death, September 24th, 2019. Victim again. I appreciate you. I love you. I think you're special. I think you're important. Moving a day closer to the victim's death, four days, September 25th, 2019. Defendant says, do you want me to end you? Victim says, no. Not going that route again either. I still haven't recovered really from last time. It opened old wounds, sorry. I'm still sorry, victim offers. And based on these messages, ladies and gentlemen, Investigator Chaz Terry, along with Investigator Anthony DeLala with the Knoxville Police Department, uh, secure an arrest instrument and travel to Bloomington, uh, Indiana, uh, where they uh, coordinate with the Bloomington Police Department to effect the arrest of the defendant in this case. Uh, you're gonna see the proof of me that the defendant was apprehended uh, when he was walking into a strip club, um, a place of employment where he uh, worked as a bouncer. And we apologize for the technical difficulties. You will have these videos with audio uh, during the course of the trial. You can see that on the same day, February 13th, the defendant uh, voluntarily spoke with investigator Chaz Terry, signed a rights waiver form, uh, and did have a conversation with him for roughly 30 minutes. Uh, and in that conversation, ladies and gentlemen, you're gonna learn that uh, the victim and the defendant met on a site called The Meagle, and that is a site you're gonna learn uh, is uh, where strangers meet each other. It's a video site where you are paired with uh, people with like interests, and you can have a conversation with a stranger. And the proof will be that at this point, 2013, uh, the victim was between the age of 13 and 14 years old, and the defendant was between the age of 20 and 21. Uh, 
you're going to hear by the defendant's own admission that uh, he and the victim at that point were both suicidal. And what he offers, uh, there's some truths in his statement uh, that they didn't mean only six years ago. Uh, he talks about how the victim was most invested in him, and that the victim, uh, he lied to her about being married, and the victim ultimately found out that he was married, uh, and based on that, stopped talking to him for a while. There was some uh, form of a re-engagement in 2017 on social media, uh, where they began talking again. And you're going to hear from the defendant's own mouth that the victim attempted to stop the relationship, but the defendant would not have it, and he pushed forward. There's some discrepancies in his statement as well. You're going to be able to hear that and weigh that statement. And one of them is that the victim wanted to play Russian roulette. But that's what the victim wants. And the only reason he pushed her is because she wanted it. And we submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, when you compare that to the proof that you're going to have throughout the course of this trial, those claims don't add up. They're not supported. Defense assertion that the victim wanted to play Russian roulette. Uh, messages. Careful. Wrong way to play Russian roulette again. Defendant. Defendant. If you can follow orders and pull the trigger quickly, no terror panic. I could do it. But I can't break you. Victim, kill me then. We can do roulette and I won't know where it is, and you can kill me. Then he claims that he pushed her because she wanted it. You're going to see throughout these messages that the victim did not want to die. She was doing these things to please him for his sexual gratification. I trust you, not actually kill me. The defendant acknowledges and knows she doesn't want to die. Sleep, it's okay. I know you don't actually want to die. Fast forward to the date that Grace Ann Sparks put a 357 Magnum into her mouth and pulled the trigger with one round in that six barrel weapon. What you're going to learn about that day, ladies and gentlemen, is by all indications, the victim was having a good day. She had been at her dance class. She'd been out to eat with a friend in Market Square. Uh, she had filled out a job application. She did not want to die. And you're going to see messages of that day between the victim and the defendant. And we submit to you, that's going to show you exactly that. Hour and 48 minutes before the victim's death. Defendant, I want to kill you. Victim, why? Defendant, I need it. Hour and 44 minutes before the victim's death. The defendant says, are you actually able to do it? The victim's response, have I ever? 47 minutes before the victim's death. The defendant says, does the thought of this make you be honest? The victim, the enjoyment you get, yes. Me actually dying? No. 45 minutes before the victim's death. The victim says, I trust you not to actually kill me. The defendant says, numbers. The victim says, but to enjoy the trust and power you be holding. 38 minutes before the victim's death, September 29, 2019. The defendant says, anything else in your mind? The victim says that I'm afraid, but I still trust you. 23 minutes before the victim's death, the defendant says, will you die for me? Victim responds, if I can't, question mark. Defendant says, can you do it, yes or no? Victim says, I don't know. It's 19 minutes before the death. 17 minutes before the victim's death, September 29, 2019. Defendant says, if you can follow orders and pull the trigger quickly, no terror panic, I could do it. But I can't break you. Victim response, I love you. This is to serve you and be good for you. 11 minutes before the victim's death. Defendant says, can you do it by orders, yes or no? Defendant says, be honest. 11 minutes before the victim's death, she responds with no. You can see at 3.48 p.m., ladies and gentlemen, uh, video conversation between Hayden Burkerbaum and Grace Ann Sparks uh, ended. Uh, by an auto-generated message that was sent to her uh, 
and the computer people. You'll also hear from Dr. Amy Hawes. She is a medical examiner. It was at the time at the Knox County uh, Medical Examiner's Office. She has since moved on to uh, medical examiner for the state of Tennessee. Uh, but she's going to talk about uh, the limited autopsy that she conducted on the victim for the sole purpose, essentially, of recovering bullet fragments from the victim's head. Uh, she's going to opine about the cause and manner of death, the cause being a gunshot wound to the head, uh, manner of death in this case being suicide. And you're going to see the fragments that were removed in the state the victim was in when that autopsy was conducted. And ladies and gentlemen, at the conclusion of this trial, after you've listened to all the evidence, you've gone through roughly 1,300 pages of messages, uh, you've heard from the witnesses, uh, we're going to ask that you find the defendant guilty of criminally negligent homicide uh, for his criminally negligent conduct uh, that resulted in Grace and Spark's death and also for filing a false report. And you're going to hear the entirety of that now on how it's filled with lies. Thank you. State's opening statement to the jury in Tennessee. Let's bring in clinical psychologist and suicide and violence counselor specialist, Dr. Norman Freed. He's a professor at Columbia University in New York and criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor, Marie Pereira, also in New York. Marie's also a registered nurse and a certified DV expert. Um, Dr. Freed, can you please give us some understanding of how th this type of behavior exists and, and why and what's going on in these people's mind, these suicide edge games? All, um, it, to a lot of people, I'm sure this is just mind-blowing and, and it's, it's difficult to comprehend why two people are engaged in this type of behavior. Well, Ted, it's a, it's a very important question, and the answer is that there are many people for whom a sense of self is missing. This young woman, Grace Ann Sparks, was saying to, to the defendant, I will do anything as long as you love me. I am here to serve you. These are statements that say, I don't have a strong selfhood. I don't really know who I am, but if I make you happy, then I will be someone. And so this comes from a personality disorder that develops over time, whereby the person says, as long as you love me, I exist. Without your love, I have no ego, I have no selfhood. And as a result, the defendant, Berkebile, is capable of taking extreme advantage of someone who has no selfhood. It is a personality style that is unfortunately more common than people know. And this young woman was clearly suffering from it. Mm, it was so sad. Marie, the yes. prosecutor, using those text messages and the clock, the winding down 11 minutes before death, 45 minutes before death, uh, how effective was that, that conclusion of the opening? I think it was extremely compelling with the time clock, and I think it really is going to create an empathy factor for the victim with the jurors. And I think it places you in the room. I wasn't there, and I felt like, oh my God, her father's in the next room listening to some audio, and she's killing herself. And I think the coercion and control was so completely demonic. This man is a psychopath. Well, that's pretty blunt, Dr. Freed. The, um, b what about the argument that both individuals partook in this role-playing over a, a period of time and that, it, um, that she was, was an active participant. That's what the, the defense is going to argue here. Yes, they are. And it's a very complicated defense and dynamic because it looks as if the two of them were cooperating with one another. But we're not recognizing this is a young woman who was significantly emotionally impaired. And she was saying through her statements things such as, I'm not going to go there. I still haven't recovered. That opens old wounds, which could be could mean that she had been in the past thinking about this, had been wounded in the past. This man was pred predatory and taking advantage. This is not not a game. These are not co uh, consulting adults. This is a young woman who unfortunately may not have been deemed mentally unwell to make these decisions, but clearly is speaking the mind of someone who is mentally unwell. This is not defensible. This is a young woman who truly wanted to live and she was even saying, I, I want to stop this relationship. 
I love you, this is to serve you, but I'm not going to go there. Clearly there was a time where someone was talking her into not letting this happen. Hopefully a therapist, maybe a good friend or parent, but he coerced her in a way that he took advantage of her mental illness. No game, no, no play here whatsoever. This is murder. It's very chilling, some of those texts back and forth, and one of them, her saying, I'm afraid, um, knowing Correct. that... Correct. She know, did not want this to happen. She had sense. no sense of who she was. Yeah.